speak to you in the name of God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Who do you say I am? This is the question that Jesus asks his disciples. And Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. If you ask people who they say Jesus is, we would get many different responses. We say that Jesus is the Christ, or God's revelation to us about God's love for all of humankind and God's desire for us to be blessed and made whole. We talk about sin as separation from God and from one another. God loves us, but Jesus shows us how we are to live in response of gratitude to God's love. An evangelical non-denominational Christian might say that Jesus is their personal savior. By believing in Jesus and his death and resurrection, their sins are washed clean and they are saved. A Roman Catholic might say that Jesus is the son of God whose church was founded on the rock of Peter, the church's first pope. They point to the passage that we heard this morning from Matthew's gospel. On Friday night, I attended a worship service that was interfaith, meaning that there were representatives from many different faith traditions, as well as many different branches of the Christian church. It was an interfaith gathering against hate and a response to the the threat of the white supremacist gathering in our city over the weekend. And it was quite beautiful and wonderful to be able to join with the typical Shabbat service that is largely in Hebrew. And even though my Hebrew was extremely rusty, I could master one of the phrases that was said over and over again, and that is Shabbat Shalom, or Sabbath peace. This is what, this is what Jewish people say to one another. On, as they participate in the, the Shabbat service on Fridays. It's Shabbat Shalom. Now, Shalom means peace. We know that. But it means a whole lot more. If you look at the whole arc of the Old Testament, in a way, there is an effort to explain, the whole thing can be seen as an effort to explain what shalom really means. It's derived from, the word shalom is derived from a root that denotes wholeness or completion, completeness. And if you look at at the whole of the Old Testament, you see this theme come up over and over again in different ways. Certainly, it has implications for the political realm because for shalom to to exist, there has to be an absence of war and there has to be an absence of strife and there has to be an absence of inequality and oppression It comes, shalom comes when people are concerned not only with their own welfare, but with the welfare of others, specifically the welfare of those on the margins, those who are less fortunate. To deny the basic needs of others undermines the possibility of shalom in our society, in any society. And interestingly, on Friday night, when we were gathered together in Temple Emmanuel, it was an African-American woman who made the point, who reminded us that Jesus was a Jew. Jesus 
was raised with this concept of shalom from his tradition. And you see it in his preaching about the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of God looks like as a place where everyone knows that they are beloved and everyone has a sense of well-being. It's really an extension of this idea of shalom. But it comes from our Jewish heritage. And yet there are are Christians today, we know, who are anti-Semitic. They forget that Jesus was a Jew. And so when, when there is talk of scapegoating and demonizing of others in the political discourse, as has been prevalent after the inauguration of our current president. It seems to have taken the lid off of those feelings that were sort of simmering below the surface. Has, it, it, the lid's been blown off, and people are openly, openly engaged in this hate speak. And whenever this happens, the Jews become quite nervous. They know what it's like to be persecuted for their very identity. And yet there are Christians who participate in this hate speak. One of the groups that was planning to come here this weekend was called Patriot Prayer an obvious reference to some sort of religious affiliation with the word prayer in the name of the group. But any time that people claim to be Christian and yet are anti-Semitic, they are not really Christian at all. Because our tradition comes from Judaism And two of the themes that we remember from the Old Testament, two of the most important themes that we are taught, is that God calls us to welcome the stranger into our home, number one. And number two, God often works through people who are from different ethnic, national, and religious backgrounds than ourselves. This is a recurrent theme. These are two recurrent themes throughout the scriptures. Jesus and most of the authors of the New Testament, if not all of the authors of the New Testament, were familiar with these themes. And so the stories that come out of the New Testament are very much consistent with their Jewish heritage. And among the stories of Jesus' ministry of healing are plenty of people from different backgrounds who receive healing. The Roman centurion, the Canaanite woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, not to mention the story of the Good Samaritan, an outsider who is singled out and lifted up as the exemplar of how we are to care for the stranger. There is so much evidence calling upon us in the scriptures to embrace the stranger, to embrace people who are different, to embrace people who are from different ethnic, religious, cultural, national backgrounds. So I suggest to you this morning that Jesus' question, who do you say I am, is a question that you and I must entertain and answer ourselves. It is imperative that we are outspoken in our understanding of who Christ is. There are strident voices who conflate bigotry and hatred of difference with Christianity. You and I must assert a different picture of what Jesus would want us to do in the face of such bigotry and hatred. As we look at this passage from Matthew's Gospel, 
Jesus asked the disciples, who do you think I am? And who responds but Peter? Because Peter is that kind of guy. He is just very impulsive, and he comes straight out with an answer. But Peter doesn't respond because he is always right. He is far from it. You recall Jesus once saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter's not the sharpest pencil in the box by any means, and yet he has confidence to respond when called upon to assert who he thinks Jesus is. So is it for this reason that Jesus decides to build his church on the rock of Peter? Is it for this reason that that Peter stands up and speaks up? He's the only one of the disciples who does. Do you recall a time in your life when you spoke up? Sometimes speaking up can get us into trouble. In particular, speaking up when we're speaking to someone who is over us in authority in a hierarchical institution. Sometimes our jobs can be on the line. And then we had that sad situation in Portland, Oregon. The three men who stood up to put themselves between a bully, a bigoted bully, violent man, who was spewing this anti-Muslim hatred, and two Muslim girls in headscarves. Three men stood up against this. Two of them were stabbed to death, and a third was seriously wounded. They stood up, and they paid a terrible price. Yet if we have learned lessons from the political turmoil and world wars of the 20th century, it is that we cannot remain silent in the face of evil. The average German citizens remain silent while a group of fascists hijacked their country and slaughtered six million Jews. This must never happen again. Our president and his entourage seem to be very good at bringing out the worst in people. White supremacists feel free to express hateful feelings and ideas with no concern about how their hatred is received by others. On Friday night, it was apparent that the Jewish community is unnerved by these slurs against the identity of others, this demonization based on identity. Anti-Semitism has never gone away. Racism has not gone away. Homophobia is alive and well. Misogyny is still with us. We live in a beautiful bubble of acceptance and the celebration of diversity in San Francisco, and it's a wonderful thing that these these fringe, far-right, hateful people were afraid to even come here. That's a great thing. This is as God wants it to be, because God created diversity, not uniformity. But we may well encounter situations where we need to speak up against bigotry and hatred. And eventually, Jesus calls each one of us to answer the question, who do you say I am? And each one of us will be called upon to answer that question for ourselves. Amen.